Sutcliffe always wanted to end up in Broadmoor. Napper literally, completely and utterly destroyed the individuals that he offended against. Bronson is an exceptional case because he really loved violence. Peter Sutcliffe had a very big post bag. It was very much a wrong kind of room. All sorts of yellows and purples and a nice dressing table with all these little ornaments and photographs and things on it. A man is literally turned into a punch bag. be going up to the patient's doors and I'd be speaking through the hatch because the patients were, were just deemed too dangerous to come out. They've done monstrous things, but that's not the same thing as them being a monster. For me, the issue is, can I find meaning in the offence? He said, I act as Ronnie Cray's butler. Can I get you a drink? We said, you know they're all mad in here. must have seen the fear in their eyes as this was going on. Violence breaks out in Broadmoor regularly, believe you me. After the killing of Francis, he was always known as Hannibal the Cannibal. There are some things that should never happen. Broadmoor. It looks like a prison, but is in fact a secure mental hospital. For over 150 years, it has been home to those judged too dangerous to live in the outside world. And since 2019, it has been even more secure with a new custom-built hospital complex. There is only one way in and out, through a high security entrance. Every single member of staff for every shift, even the senior doctors who go in there every day, have to go through like an airport level of security search. We want to be sure that nobody's getting anything into the hospital that could be immediately used as a weapon. It's surprising how many things could be, even a toothbrush can be sharpened and made into a weapon. Even things like mobile phones are considered contraband. But for the staff, it's not just their belongings they have to leave at the gate, it's their personal lives. We're heavily discouraged from talking about our personal lives in front of patients. And the reason for that is because sometimes this information can be used against you. Broadmoor is home to murderers, rapists, and arsonists. But to those who work there, they are patients in need of treatment. Our job is not to dwell on what they've done in the past, it's only to rehabilitate them for the future. They've done monstrous things. Um, but that's not the same thing as them being a monster. And what we do in Broadmoor is to try and find those parts that are not monstrous and help them to build those parts, get a proper understanding of what made the monstrous thing happen and put everything possible in place to make sure that it doesn't happen again. In the 1980s, Broadmoor's staff faced an unprecedented challenge when one of Britain's most notorious serial killers became their patient. Peter Sutcliffe, also known as the Yorkshire Ripper. Ripper victim number one. Body identified as that of 28-year-old divorcee Wilma McCann. Ripper victim number two. Body identified as that of 43-year-old Emily Jack before the Ripper struck again on a playing field in Leeds. Suckless reign of terror in the late 1970s left at least 13 women dead and plunged the nation into fear. 
The Yorkshire Ripper's trademark is the unique and vicious way in which he mutilates the bodies almost beyond recognition. There were many, many women living in places like Huddersfield and Bradford and Leeds whose lives were severely altered by Sutcliffe's activities. Everybody knew that if you've got to walk home late at night on your own, you're putting yourself at risk. I am afraid I believe he will strike again. I'm absolutely certain in my own mind that Sutcliffe would go on killing until he was stopped. In January 1981, a five-year manhunt ended and the Yorkshire Ripper was finally captured. While on remand at Armley Prison, three psychiatrists interviewed Sutcliffe. He had confessed to his crimes within days of his arrest. But it would take another two months for him to make the revelation that would change the course of his life and take him to Broadmoor. Sutcliffe reported that he was hearing the voice of God, so this is an auditory hallucination, and the voice was telling him to go on a mission to kill prostitutes, or what we would now call sex workers. Sutcliffe said today that his mission to kill began here, Bingley Cemetery, where, as a teenager, he worked as a grave digger. I was standing in an open grave, taking a rest from digging. I heard a voice similar to a human voice, but with the words mixed up, it seemed to be coming from a gravestone. I climbed out and walked up towards the grave. In the years to come, Sutcliffe came to have received hundreds of messages urging him to continue killing. As Sutcliffe's trial of the Old Bailey began, the key question was whether he deserved a life behind prison bars or if he was a mentally ill patient in need of treatment. Today, Dr. Hugo Milne, the first of three psychiatrists who will be giving evidence, has been in the witness box all day, explaining why he's convinced that Peter Sutcliffe is mad. One of the main focuses of the defense case was that he was mad that he had no control over what he did. It was all a matter of mental health. But now evidence emerged that Sutcliffe might be deliberately faking his mental illness. One of the prison officers testified and said that he had overheard Peter Sutcliffe saying that he wanted to convince others that he was, he was not of sound mind so that he would get a reduced sentence and so that he would be taken to a psychiatric setting as opposed to a prison setting. I think Sutcliffe always wanted to end up in Broadmoor, an environment which he saw as softer, as more, as easier to game than a, than a prison environment. The psychiatrists had diagnosed Sutcliffe with paranoid schizophrenia but the judge was concerned that these opinions were based on nothing more than Sutcliffe's own words. The problem with mental health illness, it's not like a broken bone. You can see that, you can't see. There's no test as far as an X-ray or anything that, that tells you someone has schizophrenia, psychotic, whatever those issues are. The theory of him faking it is possible, but I think it's very unlikely because forensic psychiatrists such as myself were very much geared to assess people, a lot of whom do fabricate and lie about his symptoms. So what we do is we don't just take the patient at face value, we look at all the available evidence. It's one thing to say you heard a voice and the voice told you to do it. That would be quite easy to, um, to make up. It's quite difficult to make up the um, life course picture that might go with having a severe and enduring illness. So. Um, it's actually quite rare for an individual to be able to sustain that kind of um, faking um, of illness. But Sutcliffe's future was now in the hands of the jury, not the psychiatrists. The jury considered uh, upon all the evidence and ultimately decided that he had control. He knew exactly what he was doing. Yes, there were some elements of schizophrenia in respect of his offending behaviour, but he knew what he was doing. In May 1981, Sutcliffe was sent to Parkhurst, but as much as he didn't want to go to prison, 
the prison system didn't want him. He was super notorious. So to put a man like that into the prison system, you're straight away inviting explosive events. Within two years of his arrival, Sutcliffe had been seriously assaulted by another inmate. His presence created problems. The most pragmatic answer to solve that particular problem was to get him off the landings of places like, you know, Parkhurst or Category A prisons and put him into Broadmoor. In March 1984, Sutcliffe finally got his wish. In the dead of night, sanctioned specifically by the Home Secretary, he was moved to Broadmoor. It was like a breath of fresh air for him. He was allowed to do almost anything he wanted within the regime of Broadmoor. There is no question that in some people's mind, Broadmoor is a bit like a holiday camp. It's like Butlins. You get what you want, you can order in food, you play games with the warders, it's all very cosy and comfy and, oh, it's not a bit like Wakefield or any of those horrid prisons like Parkhurst was. Sutcliffe was relieved to get to Broadmoor, but he refused to engage in any treatment for the first nine years of his stay. Instead, he would use his time to make the most of his fame and to make new friends outside Broadmoor's walls. People want contact um, with high-profile patients. So I don't think it's any secret, uh, and I can say this, that, for example, Peter Sutcliffe had a very big post bag. He was an avid writer. He wrote to people all the time. You know, there were letters that he would get that he just simply couldn't respond to because he was getting so many. Shockingly, the man who had brutally killed 13 women was getting many letters from female admirers. He'd now spend much of his time in Broadmoor writing love letters back. I'm a very lucky person to have you in my life this way. It's absolute bliss. If I didn't know who the author of these letters were, I'd think that they were really written by someone quite young, maybe in their 20s or 30s, someone who was very awkward with women, who thought that he could carouse them, in a sense, by writing these very throffy 1950s and 1960s expressions like super-duper and uh, absolute bliss and how wonderful. The photos are great. Wow. I can picture you there at these superb locations. Picture you're not in the photos, my sweet. And then there's the way Sutcliffe signs off, literally, at the end of the letter. Not only does he put a lot of X's and sign it Pete, but he also writes, it's Brill, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. It's very creepy, actually. It's as if he's trying to prove something and he's trying to show how nice and gentle he is, when in fact we know he's a monster. This is the Yorkshire Ripper who cold-bloodedly killed women without even bothering to find out their names. But Sutcliffe wouldn't stop at letter writing. He'd convince his female pen pals to visit. Sutcliffe always had with him a couple of, of young women, different women every time, always holding his hand, stroking his hands, etc. But inside the visiting room, he'd also come face to face with his enemies. Peter Sutcliffe wasn't allowed to talk to Ronnie Cray or even look at Ronnie Cray. It's one of Britain's most secretive institutions, but Broadmoor Hospital often finds itself in the media spotlight thanks to its infamous patients. People generally know when there's a high-profile patient in the hospital. There's often an intensive campaign by the press to try and get information. They can try and bribe staff. They can try and make links to other patients. And it's not just the press who are drawn to Broadmoor's notorious criminals. Members of the public often want to make contact. It's a bit like your five minutes of fame. You know, I've spoken to the Yorkshire Ripper, I've spoken to this person. 
people really enjoy it. Long-term patient Peter Sutcliffe was allowed four visitors per week, and they were often pen pals who he had persuaded to meet him in person. Sutcliffe always had with him a couple of, of young women, different women every time, always holding his hand, stroking his hands, etc. It was very, very strange. I mean, I guess they liked the thrill of being near to a dangerous man, but knowing that he couldn't harm them because all around the room were the hospital staff. And when Sutcliffe wasn't with visitors or writing letters, he was on the phone. This is a call from Broadmoor Hospital. Please be aware that this call may be recorded. For years, he would speak to his brother Carl every Tuesday evening. Hello, Carl. Hello, oh, Pete. How's things all right? Oh, not so bad. You doing all right health-wise, are you? A bit better, yeah. I feel a bit better now. Still not 100%, though. A frequent topic of conversation was Sutcliffe's prolific letter writing. Don't you get writer's cramp with all that writing from your fingers? I did get writer's cramp for quite a while. Oh, but but anyway, I've got busy. It's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday now. Oh, Next right. week. Busy, yeah? So that'll keep me off the ward for a while. Uh, One conversation from 2012 revealed that even as Sutcliffe approached 70, he was still attracting the attention of younger women. High profile patients and the strangers who want to visit them can cause a real headache for Broadmoor staff. Another man who'd seriously damaged children had women wanting to visit him with their children and were even prepared um, to get their solicitors to argue with us about their right to bring their children to, to, to see him. These were not people who were related to this man. It's a constant process of, of, of trying um, to, to, to manage that situation so that you're decent to everyone. And it's an interesting question. Why do those people do it? And I think there's a fascination. There's a fascination amongst the public to look into other people's lives. And when you've got someone as notorious and well-known as some of the criminals that end up at Broadmoor, people want to know, what are they about? I want to talk to them. Peter Sutcliffe was eventually transferred to Franklin Prison in 2016, where he died four years later. He had spent nearly half of his life in Broadmoor. People do need sometimes a long time to come to terms with what they've done, to begin to be able to reflect on it. Although we can't absolutely say everyone can change, we can't, and not everyone will get out, but there is capacity for change and for rehabilitation. It's very difficult to know as a result of the period of time that Sutcliffe spent in Broadmoor, that he changed, he came out a different person. What we do know is that having come out of Broadmoor, the state is millions of pounds worse off. It costs between 250 to 300,000 pounds per year to keep a person at Broadmoor. He was there for over 30 years. Peter Sutcliffe had made the most of his time at Broadmoor. But one of his fellow patients would take Broadmoor's perks to a whole new level. I went down to the visiting hall at Broadmoor. I was taken to a, a formica table and I sat there. And a young man came up to me with a white coat on. And he said, hello. He said, I act as Ronnie Cray's butler. Can I get you a drink? The Cray twins, Ronnie and Reggie, ruled London's underworld throughout the 50s and 60s. They were powerful but feared, their celebrity status underpinned by violent assaults, torture and murder. So to remain in their positions, to be the alpha males, they couldn't accept any disrespect. So I think that was part of what drove their violence. The twins had seemed untouchable, but on the 9th of March, 1966, Ronnie's actions would begin their downfall. At 8.30 p.m., 
he walked into the Blind Beggar pub and shot and killed George Cornell. No right-thinking man would have shot another gangster in cold blood in front of witnesses in a pub. I think Ronnie was, was ready to be caught. Three years later, both twins were convicted of murder and handed life sentences. Inseparable since birth, the twins were about to lead very different lives behind bars. And what would divide them was mental illness. At the age of 22, Ronnie had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Ronnie's ongoing mental illness problems definitely drove forward the violence that the craze committed. His twin Reggie was a calmer guy, but then Ronnie, Ronnie demanded retribution. He demanded violence, not just because he wanted to spread the word that they were a scary pair, but also because he enjoyed it. Ronnie even used hot pokers on some of his enemies and took great delight in watching those pokers sizzle the skin of an enemy. After a stint in prison with Reggie, Ronnie was moved to Broadmoor in July 1979. It would be his home for the next 16 years. And it was from here that he would tell his story to his biographer, television presenter Fred Dynage, starting with his very first day at Broadmoor. I will never forget the day I came to Broadmoor because no patient ever does. I was taken to what they call the admission ward. I was weighed and my height was measured. Then I was told to get into a bath. The male nurses, the screws, stood watching me all the time. If you behave yourself, it's heaven. If you don't behave yourself, it's hell. Ronnie found a way to play by Broadmoor's rules and soon became known as the Duke of Broadmoor. And the place where he showed off his status was the visiting hall. Former model Maureen Flanagan was a friend and a regular visitor. Well, the first time I went, I went with Charlie Cray, the elder brother. When we walked in, we were on time. In fact, we were five minutes early. And we sat down and I thought, well, everybody else has got a visit and it's gone two o'clock and I'm looking, I'm looking. It's now quarter past two and I sort of, I'm impatient to, to see him. And then the jingle jangle of the keys. And you could hear these leather shoes on this wooden floor. I heard marching feet and I realised it was going to be Ronnie Cray because they called him the Colonel because he marched everywhere. And when he walked in, you saw heads turn and people poking each other and saying, that's Ronnie Cray. And I just looked at him and I thought, well, you look exactly the same as the last time you were on the street. He was immaculate dressed, like an Italian suit, white starch shirt, beautiful Italian silk tie, hanky, gold watch. I thought, oh my God, I went, you look, you look wonderful, Ronnie, you look smart. He said, well, I've got to keep up appearances. With a little help from his visitors, Ronnie was able to maintain aspects of his former life of luxury. I took a tailor into Broadmoor every October. He said, I've got to have a new suit. And I thought, I said, Ronnie, why have you got to have a new suit? You're not going anywhere. Do you go to the disco in here? Because I'd heard there's a disco on Saturday. He said, I don't want to go with those, mix with those people. He said, you know, they're all mad in here. Ronnie had respect for the other patients, but Ronnie always regarded himself, uh, probably quite rightly, uh, in, within the Broadmoor, Broadmoor hierarchy, he regarded himself as being the top dog, the, the main man. And central to his status was his butler, who was actually a fellow patient. I had a chat with this young man who told me his name was Charlie Smith, and he was a double murderer, and he was a very good friend of Ronnie and did a lot of jobs for Ronnie around the hospital. And then he went like that as though he was in a, a, a posh restaurant. 
And up come this boy, and he said, what can I get you, Ron? You remember what I asked you to get in the kitchen? He said, yes, Ron. Go and get them then. Why haven't you bought them with the tea? He said, well, I had to carry the tray. I'm going now. And up came two strawberry tarts. I just couldn't believe it, that he could order this sort of delicacy in a place that is really um, an asylum. One aspect of the visiting room that Ron couldn't control was the company. He said, there's that slag over there. And I thought, where, where am I supposed to look? Very often at an adjoining table would be Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, who wasn't allowed to talk to Ronnie Cray or even look at Ronnie Cray because the Cray twins had no time whatsoever for for the people who defended against children or women. And then he said, Maureen, get up and move. I said, no, I'm OK here, Ron. I'm fine. He said, no, please, move around until I tell you where to, to stop the chair. So we all had to stand up and, and move so that I wasn't in the eye line of Peter Sutcliffe. It was in the visiting room that Ronnie would start to tell his life story to Fred. Most of our early conversations took place in that visiting hall. Then Broadmoor began to trust me more, and we were given a private room to converse in. Eventually, Fred would get to see parts of Broadmoor that no outsiders would ever see. He was once able to bring in a camera and catch this rare glimpse of Ronnie outside his room. He really had quite a smart room there. He'd been allowed to decorate it the way he wanted it. All sorts of yellows and purples, which were very much his colours, and a nice dressing table with all these little ornaments and photographs and things on it. He loved his music. He was allowed a record player in his room. It was very much a Ron kind of room at last, and it, it felt almost like a hotel bedroom. Ronnie was one of the luckier patients. During his time at Broadmoor, many slept in communal dormitories. One of the big tasks in reforming um, Broadmoor and the other hospitals was to create more personal spaces. Um, and so now I think it's true to say that in every secure hospital, patients would have their own individual rooms. And usually they have their own ensuite. And unlike in high security prisons, patients on most of Broadmoor's wards have the keys to their own rooms. As far as possible, the rooms are the patient's own space. Patients can lock themselves into their rooms, but obviously the staff have an override. It then means that they can keep other patients out. They're not supposed to have other patients into their rooms at all. That really is supposed to be um, <clears throat> their space, and staff try quite hard to make sure that they, they don't breach that rule. Ronnie Cray had played by Broadmoor's rules in order to have a comfortable life. But one of his fellow patients was about to unleash a wave of destruction on Broadmoor itself. You have to walk across a big courtyard. And on a particular time, I walked across the courtyard with Mrs. Cray and Charlie Cray, and we heard a commotion. <laughs> There was shouting, screaming, you know, an alarm was going on. <laughs> we looked up, we heard, hello, hello. We looked up on the roof and Charlie Bronson was throwing down all the slates and absolutely demolishing the roof. And when he saw Charlie Cray and Mrs Cray, he was waving and stopped. Stopped what he was doing until we were passed over to, you know, the courtyard and into Broadmoor. And then we heard this dreadful commotion again. The man on the roof had arrived at Broadmoor as Michael Peterson, but would later be known as Britain's most violent prisoner, Charles Bronson. Michael Peterson literally emerges as Charles Bronson on the roof of Broadmoor. His extraordinary behavior was about to bring him fame, but also put him in conflict with Broadmoor staff. I would not like to be in a 
on shift that had to medicate Bronson against his will. I mean, he was a big, violent man. Broadmoor is no ordinary hospital. All clinical staff here are trained in physical restraint techniques. Violence breaks out in Broadmoor regularly, believe you me. Quite often people are very, very unwell or in a very distressed or angry state and um, not completely in control of how they're coping with things, how they behave. They resort to um, attacks. So one of the big challenges about delivering care in a high secure hospital like Broadmoor is the tension between care and control. I specifically worked in the high dependency unit. So the patients that I worked with were acutely disturbed and potentially very aggressive. So for some of the reviews, I'd be going up to the patient's doors and I'd be speaking through the hatch because the patients were, were just deemed too dangerous to come out. Difficult behaviours are nothing new to Broadmoor staff. But in 1979, they faced an unprecedented challenge with the arrival of Michael Peterson, later known as Charles Bronson. Michael Peterson was essentially an armed robber. Quite a nasty armed robber, but certainly not the extraordinary figure that Charles Bronson was to become. Michael Peterson began what should have been a seven-year prison sentence in 1974. But his crime on the outside would pale in comparison to the wave of violent assaults he would unleash behind bars. Bronson wasn't picky about who he assaulted. He had this inner anger that constantly came out. And as a result, uh, prison guards would be attacked, other inmates would be attacked, even civilian staff members in prisons were attacked. The guy just seemed to be on the rampage. I think Bronson is an exceptional case because I think he really loved violence. So actually, his index offence that he was in prison for was for only for seven years for armed robbery. It wasn't actually that serious. But once he was institutionalised, he just constantly uh, kept getting into fights. In 1978, Bronson was sectioned after a suicide attempt and the following year was sent to Broadmoor but he would spend the next five years trying to get back to prison. Bronson quickly christened his fellow patients, Broadmites and loons, because once he got to Broadmoor, he decided that he was in some way above most of them. Soon after getting to Broadmoor, uh, Bronson exploded and attacked another patient with a tie, and he would have ended up strangling him, except the tie broke. In an audio recording, Bronson would later reveal the details of another violent interaction with a Broadmoor patient. I said, right then, well, what do you want, mate? I wondered if you'd hit me. I said, what are you talking about? You want me to hit you? He says, well, I like people to hit me. I said, all right, then. Where do you want me to hit you? He said, I'll win the face. So anyway, I've, I've caught him a preacher of a right-hander on the chin. As he's going down, I've caught him with a left, a right, an upper, and another right. I sparked him out. He's that cold. And as he's coming round, he went, ooh, ooh, that was lovely. The fascinating part of this clip is when Bronson sounds quite taken aback that the person who asked him to beat him up then thanks him for doing such a good job. It's sort of like, a, I suppose, a unique position for Bronson to be in. He's used to hitting people who don't want to be hit. I think that Bronson really doesn't see himself as being in the same place as a lot of the other patients. That explains why he, he really hates the place. Soon afterwards, Bronson would turn his rage on Broadmoor itself. On the 21st of May, 1981, while being escorted to the canteen, Bronson broke free and climbed up a drain pipe. When 
when he was asked by one of the nurses what he was doing up there, he just said he wanted a cheese roll, a coffee and a cream cake. He was a very black and white, very honest person in a strange way. And he says, tell the superintendent, thanks for the coffee and the grub and everything, and say goodbye to your roof. And then off he goes. This was to be the first of Bronson's three rooftop protests at Broadmoor. He stayed on the roof for up to four days at a time and caused 250,000 pounds worth of damage. It would also bring him fame. It's a very good way of drawing attention to yourself. He wants to be the focus of attention. He doesn't want to be just prisoner number 693476. Michael Peterson literally emerges as Charles Bronson on the roof of Broadmoor. Bronson's biggest complaint about Broadmoor was that he was forcibly injected with medication, a practice that continues today. Under the provisions of the Mental Health Act, because the patients are detained, we are allowed to give them medication against their will. And that's obviously a, a last resort, because it's not pleasant for anybody, not pleasant for the staff, not pleasant for the patients. But if somebody's psychotic and they lack insight, then the chances are they're not going to change their minds and then they're not going to get better without medication. So what would happen is we would, depending on the, uh, the risk level of the patient and their size and their ferocity, we would decide how many nurses are needed. So typically it might be three or four nurses. They would go to the patient's room and if necessary, they would, they would physically restrain them while an, another nurse gives the, gives the medication. I would not like to be a nurse on shift that had to medicate Bronson against his will. Uh, even though they're very used to that. I mean, he was a big, violent man. I just don't think that would have been a fun role <laughs> for anybody. Like many of Broadmoor's patients, Bronson refused to accept his diagnosis, which made rehabilitating him a near impossible task. Bronson never saw himself as in need of therapy. I think he thought Broadmoor wasn't the right place for him. In fact, the three psychiatrists who sectioned Bronson couldn't agree on a diagnosis. Charles Bronson was diagnosed with psychopathy and schizophrenia, although it was never agreed by clinicians um, and a consensus wasn't reached. I think if he had schizophrenia, it's possible, but I, don't, I haven't personally seen any evidence, any clear evidence that he was suffering psychosis. I think he almost certainly was a psychopath. While schizophrenia can be managed with medication, psychopathy is a form of personality disorder and much harder to treat. If your personality is disordered, then by definition you're clashing with other people. So a psychopath is like being the older brother of antisocial personality disorder. And the sufferer doesn't know or doesn't care about the difference between right and wrong. With personality disorder, there is no magic pill and it's really about engaging individuals and relying on the patient to meet us halfway because it's verbal therapies that are the ones we use. And that means people have to open up, they have to contribute, they have to think about things. Many believe that psychopathy can never be cured. There's a theory that psychopaths, they will never change their actual internal personalities, but they're clever enough and they're manipulative enough to pretend to change. I personally don't think that treatment for psychopathy works, but I know that some of my peers would disagree. Bronson never engaged with therapy at Broadmoor. In the spring of 1984, he went on hunger strike for 18 days until his demands for a transfer were met. A year later, he was back in the general prison population. He likes prison life. Prison is where he likes to be. It's, it's his comfort blanket. He understands prison. I think people often think that um, a secure hospital is a soft option. And um, I think it's important to be really clear, high secure hospital is tough. The expectations include always having to talk about how you're feeling and what you're thinking. Some people find that uh, really irritating. But back in prison, Bronson's violence continued. He's now served 47 years, much of it in solitary confinement. 
the time is added on. He'll go before a parole board and they just look at him as much as say, Charlie, look what you've done this year. Look who you've attacked this year. And more time is added on. He's never murdered anybody. He's never raped anybody, but he's violent. And that's against him. Not all of Broadmoor's patients have been as disruptive as Bronson. The 1990s would see the arrival of a quiet man whose meek exterior hid atrocious crimes. Whoever attacked Samantha Bissett had more than just plunged a knife into her. He must have seen the fear in their eyes as this was going on. He must have just seen them as objects for his gratification. Broadmoor. Some of Britain's most notorious killers have lived here behind locked doors. But it's not a prison. A lot of people assume that Broadmoor is a prison. And from the outside, it, it looks like a prison. The main difference is that we are there to treat and rehabilitate. But treating those who have committed atrocious crimes can take its toll. We're very careful and very sensible about how we meet with people, where we sit, who knows where we are, but having some glimpse or insight into what it might have been like for the victim, suddenly that might overwhelm and one suddenly feels a sort of wave of fear that seems to belong more to the victim than to rea the reality of the situation in which I'm in. In the 1990s, Broadmoor's staff would be forced to examine a series of unusually brutal and disturbing crimes. November 4th, 1993. Police are called to the flat of 27-year-old Samantha Bissett in Plumstead, South London. I walked into the flat and immediately on the left, there was a bedroom. There was only a one-bedroom flat. And I could see the body of a, a young girl who was, in fact, Jasmine Bissett, three-year-old child lying in a cot. She appeared to be asleep. And the duvet was pulled up to her chin. She had lovely red curly hair, but her lips were blue. And that is an image that um, will always stay with me. She had, in fact, been uh, suffocated. And as we later discovered from the post-mortem, sexually assaulted as well. We went through into the main room, and there was the victim, Samantha, who had, was laid out in the front room on her back, but she had been horribly disfigured and dismembered. Whoever attacked Samantha Bissett had more than just plunged a knife into her. Some detectives I knew actually said, you know, it looks as if she's been surgically examined. Samantha had her legs cut at the knees, at the hip. Her body had been totally cut from throat to vulva, opened up. Her inner organs were uh, messed about. Her face had been badly cut. It was a, it was a, and horrific sight. The crime scene was one of the worst crime scenes, certainly, that the Metropolitan Police at that time had dealt with. So much so that the investigating crime scene photographer actually had to take some time off, uh, along with colleagues, because it was so horrific. The prime thing that any detective will look for is, is motive. What, why, why did this happen? No matter how much you hated somebody, you just wouldn't do that, especially with the child in the other room. Six months later, a fingerprint led police to Samantha and Jasmine's killer, a man called Robert Knapper. He was so mild-mannered as to make you even start to wonder whether we had the right man. 
His appearance was of a weak man, a very weak man. But the contents of Napa's bedsit revealed his calculating and sadistic side. We found all sorts of daggers and knives and books on mutilation. And we found all sorts of drawings. And the drawings included a rough map of Samantha's flat, the woods opposite, a little path down the side, and a path at the back. Now police interviewed Napa, hoping to understand his motive. But he refused to engage, revealing instead a number of paranoid delusions. He would refer to um, meetings with the Queen, where he would discuss matters of state. He was convinced that he, um, he was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. A number of psychologists diagnosed Napa with paranoid schizophrenia and Asperger's syndrome. He was mentally disordered and dangerous. In June 1995, he was sent to Broadmoor. It was now the job of the staff there to sit face to face with him and make sense of his atrocious crimes. When I was at Broadmoor, we almost invariably had the whole, shall I call it the crime package, including the, the police reports from um, the, the scene of the crime and so on. And I would make myself read all of that. It's important that I have that anchor. It's also important that I don't, in my mind, diminish anything of what happened, that I've really got the measure of it. There are some crimes, I think, where it does affect us at that point. And actually, often, meeting the individual is the first time where our feelings of horror and uh, the emotional distress from reading the documentation starts to abate. For me, the issue is, can I find meaning in the offence, in the choice of victim, in their approach, in what happened, how were they feeling, what was in their mind at that time, what did they think was in the mind of the victim. There are all sorts of details about the offence which are really illuminating. Now Napa opened up to psychologists about his own childhood sexual abuse. Because he was sexually abused himself, I wonder if, that's, if that warped his understanding of sexuality in terms of what's appropriate and where the boundaries lie. We never consider a traumatic event to be an excuse or a complete explanation. It's part of the understanding of the pathway to offending. Napa's combination of schizophrenia and Asperger's would make him a challenging patient to treat. So somebody with Asperger's can be quite difficult to treat, especially if the Asperger's is directly linked to violent behaviour. There's no medication that can reverse the thought patterns of Asperger's. Because of his Asperger's, he was probably less able to identify or care about the fear that he saw in his victims. He must have seen the fear in their eyes as this was going on and he must have been completely disconnected in terms of empathy. He must have just seen them as objects for his gratification. In October 1995, Napa left Broadmoor to go on trial at the Old Bailey. He was found guilty not only of killing Samantha and Jasmine, but of a number of violent rapes. He was sent back to Broadmoor indefinitely, but more horror was to emerge. At Broadmoor, Napa was hiding a dark secret, his involvement in the most infamous unsolved murder of the era, Rachel Nacal. It was here that Rachel was found yesterday, stabbed repeatedly, sexually assaulted, her two-year-old son Alexander clinging to her body. Broadmoor, home to some of our most notorious killers and whose staff are faced with the daunting task of treating them. I think it's really important to be a good forensic psychiatrist to separate the act that the patient has done from the actual person themselves. And our job is never to judge the patient. 
There's a very pragmatic reason for trying to make sense of very destructive acts, and that is because ultimately we want to look forward and see whether we can reduce the risks that an individual poses to others. Killer and rapist Robert Knapper has been held at Broadmoor since 1995. Robert Knapper has always kept a very low-key existence in, in Broadmoor. He's supposed to keep himself to himself, quite shy, likes to be known as Bob, but slightly more disturbingly, he has a habit of staring at some of the female staff, which makes them very uncomfortable, particularly when you consider what the crimes are that he's committed. Napa had confessed to the brutal killing of Samantha and Jasmine Bissett. But for nine years, those who lived and worked alongside him at Broadmoor had no idea that he was responsible for another murder, one that had shocked the nation. A minute search of the scene resumed today, officers scouring Wimbledon Common for perhaps one vital piece of evidence. Rachel Nickell had been sexually assaulted and stabbed 49 times in broad daylight. Her two-year-old son, Alex, was found clinging to her body. Alex, famously, it's a story that brings tears to your eyes, you know, is left sitting beside his mother saying, wake up, mummy. That woman went out for a walk that day. She wasn't very far from home. She was in a place that was well used. So she probably, you know, had no reason to think that she was putting herself in any kind of risk at all. This frenzied attack happened just over a year before the Bissett murders and bore striking similarities. But the case went unsolved for a decade until advances in DNA techniques led to a breakthrough. A trace of DNA was found from the panties of Rachel in the elastic Nickerband, and when they were compared to the all of the 80 or 90 suspects that they had, they were all eliminated, apart from one, Robert Clive Napper. At the Old Bailey in December 2008, Napper pleaded guilty to Rachel's manslaughter. He returned to Broadmoor, where he remains today. But many believe that he may be responsible for many more violent crimes. Napa is, for me, one of the most dangerous offenders. And there are many others, sadly, but he's one of the most dangerous because his offenses were just brutal and without any caring at all. He literally, completely and utterly destroyed the individuals that he offended against. Do I think Napa is responsible for other crimes? Absolutely. There's no doubt that he's carried out other violent sexual attacks. Is he responsible for other murders? I think so. Napa has now been at Broadmoor for 26 years. During this time, only one set of photos of him have appeared. Napa, along with a lot of the patients at Broadmoor, likes to spend quite a lot of his time outside on the allotment. Broadmoor's allotments have been a key part of patient rehabilitation since the hospital was founded over 150 years ago. You have to understand that these patients, especially in high secure units like Broadmoor, they're there for a long period of time sometimes years, sometimes decades. So you need to keep them occupied, you need to keep them stimulated. We have a number of individuals on what's called whole life tariff. They're never going to be released and have no hope of it. And it is extraordinarily difficult to know how to work with such individuals, what's in it for them, uh, what purpose is there to their life. It is a very difficult situation. But there was one individual who came to accept that he'd never be free, Ronnie Cray. Once he was in Broadmoor, he felt safe. No one's going to attack you, and you're not going to have to attack people because you'll be medicated properly. He was quite happy with his life in there. He loved his gardening. Four mornings a week, when the weather was good, he'd be in the back gardens of the hospital. He was very happy doing his painting and writing his po He loved writing poems. He really was quite a sort of gentleman of leisure, really. The only problem was he was stuck within the four walls of Broadmoor. 
But even at Broadmoor, despite the heavy medication, Ronnie's dark moods would occasionally take over. When he was in Broadmoor, you'd know it was a bad day. During the visit, he used to rub his hand, do this to his hands. And I used to look at the other, um, the other visitor and, and say, you know, and then about quarter past three, he'd look at the clock, look at his watch and say, I've got to go now. I'd say, oh, but Ronnie, we've got another half an hour. No, I've got to go now. He knew. He knew it was one of his bad days. And I'd say, oh, Ronnie, what's the matter? And he'd say, no, it's best I go. And decades after the crime that had brought him to Broadmoor, Ronnie showed no signs of remorse. The only thing that, that always saddened me about Ronnie was, I'd say, Ron, you know, do you feel sorry for what you did? You know, do you feel sorry for shooting George Cornell and killing him? No. Ronnie said to me, his actual quote was, uh, when he shot George Cornell, uh, the actual words he used were, I've never felt so fucking alive which shocked me, you know, as a law-abiding citizen, I found it quite shocking. He said it was better than sex. He actually said that. Oh, that was the best feeling I've ever had. I, I got a real high, I'm on a high of that. With his gangster life behind him, Ronnie would look for new highs. And to the surprise of many, he would use Broadmoor's visiting room as a place to find a wife. Well, Ronnie always said, he, he, he said, I'm not homosexual, I am bisexual. I like men and I like women. And I would presume, you know, I mean, I don't have any knowledge, but I would presume that, you know, that he had his friends within, within Broadmoor. Ronnie would marry not once, but twice within Broadmoor's walls to women who had written him letters. His second wife, Kate Howard, was 23 years his junior. She was blonde and bubbly, a kissagram girl. She went to Reggie first, and he said, go and visit Ronnie. And after, you know, after half a year or seven months, whatever, Kate, you and me are going to get married. I knew I was going to marry you the first time you walked in here. She said, well, I didn't. I think someone also had said to him, look, Ron, if ever you want to get out of here, if ever you want to get parole, you need to have a nice, steady home life. I'm sure that's why he got married, because he'd got this dream of, this dream of freedom, which, of course, uh, he never realized. Ronnie never did get his freedom. In March 1995, at the age of 61, he had a heart attack at Broadmoor and died two days later. Broadmoor is full of men who have committed horrendous crimes on the outside. But the staff's worst nightmare is finding a crime scene inside the hospital's walls. There are some things that should never happen. They hold his body up so that the Broadmoor staff can see his dead body through the spy hole. Broadmoor Hospital is home to around 200 of Britain's most dangerous men. Security is paramount. I think there are two scenarios which are going to give you a headache if you're running Broadmoor. One is if you discharge a patient who goes off to kill somebody in the community, and another one is if a patient kills or hurts another patient within Broadmoor. Things will go wrong in the best organised of circumstances, but there are some things that should never happen. On the 26th of February, 1977, an incident took place that would haunt Broadmoor staff to this day. A man is literally turned into a punch bag. A mannequin, a doll. To
be kicked, to be hit. His head was hit against the wall. He was almost certainly stamped on regularly. He was punched, kicked. The victim was patient David Francis. Holding him hostage were two other patients, David Cheeseman and Robert Maudsley. They had barricaded the door. It would remain locked for nine hours. What must have been going through David Francis's mind during that nine-hour ordeal? He must have been terrified for his life. They hogtied Francis with a cable from a record player. There are allegations that he may have had his skin flayed. On the other side of the door, staff were powerless to stop Maudsley and Cheeseman until it was too late. In the end, they kill Francis in the locked room in Broadsmoor. And they hold his body up so that the prison staff, the Broadmoor staff, can see his dead body through the spy hole. When staff finally opened the door, they were met with a scene of absolute horror. In Broadmoor, they weren't allowed plastic knives, but they could have forks and spoons. Maudsley had broken the plastic spoon so that it formed a weapon, a sharp weapon, and he'd shoved it into Francis's ear. But the legend had it when Maudsley was released from the room and back into captivity, that he'd split Francis's head open and eaten his brains with the spoon. Now, that was never the case, but nevertheless, that's where Maudsley's reputation and his nicknames came from. After the killing of Francis, he was always known as Hannibal the Cannibal, or Spoons, because of the spoon. It seems Robert Maudsley had targeted Francis because he was a convicted paedophile. He must have been extremely judgmental about what this man did and also what this man represented. It seemed that he wasn't just trying to rid the world of one more child molester. He, he took pleasure in, in punishing this man. Francis wasn't Maudsley's first victim, and he wouldn't be his last as he tried to take revenge for his own childhood abuse. It is impossible to overestimate just how horrific Maudsley's childhood was. And at one point in his young life, he was locked away in his room for six months. And the only time that anyone came in to see him was his father, who came in literally maybe two or even three times a day to beat him. Uh, sticks, rods. Um, at one point, he broke a 22 air rifle over his back. Maudsley's attack at Broadmoor would serve as a cautionary tale for decades to come. Today, regular room searches are carried out to check for potential weapons. There's procedural security so that you can check um, what things people have in their possession. And it's all done in conjunction with the patients. It's not like you suddenly ride roughshod in, but, you know, today we'd like to go through the things in your room and just check that nothing's got in here that shouldn't. I think it's very unlikely that an attack like the one committed by Maudsley would happen today. And that's because even on the wards where the patients have a lower level of risk, there's still some observation by staff. They're still checked in on regularly, even at night time. The nurses will go around and they'll look in individual rooms to make sure that the patient group is safe. This notorious incident marked the end of Maudsley's time at Broadmoor, but not the end of his killing spree. He was then sent to Wakefield Prison, where he killed two inmates. He remains there to this day, in solitary confinement, in a custom-built cell. It's a cell that you would recognize from Silence of the Lambs. It has a perspex front. It has brick on the other three sides. He spends 23 hours of the day in the cell, and he's permitted to come out from one hour a day with a number of staff members escorting him. 
No other British prisoner has spent so long in solitary confinement. At one point, Maudsley has said that he effectively finds himself now back in the room he was locked in as a child by his father. And he seems to have spent almost his entire life locked in rooms. It's as if he's never escaped the locked room. It's part of his character, part of his personality. For over 150 years, Broadmoor has served not just to protect us from Britain's most dangerous individuals, but to successfully rehabilitate many. Today, its mission continues. I guess we're always going to need places like Broadmoor. If you look at America, where mental uh, illness is not considered very often a defense for murder and other serious crimes. And we look on America as being a very harsh society for that reason. I think it's important that we acknowledge the mental problems that are associated to some of the biggest crimes that have been committed in this country. But it also has another important role. Broadmoor is a valuable institution as a means of learning. We should always be searching for answers to understand more about the human mind, to find out why there is aberrant behavior. The way out of major disorder is research. If we go on not knowing what to do in various circumstances, we can't help people. And perhaps most importantly, Broadmoor and its patients could help prevent future crimes. We're still no good at all at identifying who is going to commit a terrible offence if they haven't already um, committed a serious offence. The more educated, the more learnt we are, perhaps the greater opportunity we have at protecting the most vulnerable. A case with new information emerging only last week. The clues that caught the killer, Fred and Rose West, is streaming now on My5. There's no let up for officers on shift next tonight on Channel 5, inside the force 24 7, in just a mo.